Kenneth? Yes, you can get going, certainly. Start. Start. Please do. Okay, if I could just ask everyone to mute, that would be kind of... Do you want to make me a host, um, co-host? Uh, Rabbi uh, Portnoy, if you're there, can you make Diane Paddock co-host? I don't know if he's still there. I'll try to ring him. Okay, don't worry. It's fine. It's fine. As long as everyone's on mute. Uh, no, I can. I am. I am. I can mute people. That's fine. That's all I need. Okay, great. Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome. It's nice to be back again. Um, I was told that the uh, topic for today, preferred topic, would be surrogacy and the halachic status of a surrogate child. And so essentially what we're going to discuss this morning is, is the child of a non-Jewish surrogate mother Jewish? And these questions, unfortunately, are common questions. Um, not everyone merits to have children easily. And these can be difficult questions when it comes to these extra considerations. Already enough of a headache when you have um, couples struggling to have children, but even more so when they have extra complications with it as well. And so what we will go through this morning are the sources, different opinions, and in the and after doing all of that, the actual practice today of Batei Dinim across the world when it comes to these questions. So let's start from the beginning. Um, and we have to remind ourselves that the very concept of using a surrogate uh, or IVF is in itself contentious. So here you have the Pasuk in Bereshit where Rachel struggling to have children. So Rachel doesn't have children. She's jealous. She says, I need children. Otherwise, I do not, I don't want to live anymore. Yaakov gets angry with Rachel. And Yaakov says, what do you want from me? You know, it's not my, it's not my position to grant you um, or, or, or to prevent you from having children. Why are you crying out to me? And the Midrash says that this, uh, that Yaakov was reprimanded for this. Is this the way you respond to those who are in distress, those who are troubled? Yes, Yaakov is right that he's unable to help Rachel have children. It's not within his capacity whether he can or not, but nonetheless, it's all the way you respond to such a person. We have a mitzvah to try to assist people who are struggling with um, these condition, you know, with this condition of being able to have children, to help as much as possible. And therefore, especially with the scientific developments that we have today, we have a duty to do our best to assist couples that are struggling to conceive. And you should know, going back 50, 60 years ago, there was a whole question of IVF and using a surrogate mother in the first place. And there was a big debate. Uh, famously, the Satma Rebbe at the time said that this is this is Mamash. He said this is not this is of the highest class. He said this is uh, the children of Mamzerim, and you know he was very against it. And Moshe Feinstein was the one who really allowed it, and which is why it's become the norm in the vast majority of circles. The norm today to be able to uh, use IVF. And I'll tell you a story which I personally heard from Rabbi Asher Weiss Shlita. There is a certain Rav in, uh, well, let's say there's nothing to, Rabbi Shavai said this, I can say it. Rabbi Chaim Kenievsky is against using IVF. And um, Dov, we'll take questions later, okay? Let me just get into it, we'll take questions later. So Rabbi Chaim Kenievsky is against using IVF. And um, I was at a breakfast with Rabbi Shavai a couple of years ago, and I remember someone asking him about this, what's the Rav's opinion on this? And the, the powerful answer, which I won't forget, Rasha Rice answers, he said, you look a couple in their eyes and tell them that they can't avail themselves to uh, science to have children. So how do you have the, the shoulders to do that? Do you have the, 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 the emotional responsibility to be able to do something to that to, to a couple? And then he went on and he said, even if Chaim Kanievsky's own grandchild used IVF, and Chaim Kanievsky's great-grandchild has been created through the use of IVF. 
And so uh, this is basically today a, uh, it's basically, a, uh, uh, it's been accepted now that it's, it's very normal and it's accepted within halakha that a couple use IVF <laughs> in order to conceive. And I think today it would be extremely wrong to, um, to prevent a couple from using it on the grounds of halakha. So once we've established that that can be used, um, and that is common practice. The question then becomes is who is the, who is the halachic parent? Who is the halachic mother? So let's start with the English law. And those who are not familiar with this may be surprised to learn this. And that is the section 40, 54 of the FHEA Act 2008. It, basically, I'm not going to go through it, in all, but it's all there. Section 54 of the Human Fertilization and Embryo Act 2008. In short, English law provides that it's the act of parturition which, um, which creates the legal parent. So it's the actual carrier, not the egg mother, but rather the carrier who is the mother. So if an embryo is deposited in a third party, and she go, gives birth to a child, that person who gave birth, the act of parturition, that is the legal mother. Of course, the law does provide that the court may make an order to grant the child to the owner of the gametes. There are provisions for that. And the vast majority of scenarios that happens, but you need to be aware is that these agreements in English law are not enforceable. They are not enforceable. So if you come to an agreement with a third party to carry the fetus for you, and she can, does so, and you come to an agreement, look, I'll pay you £10,000 to do so. So the law, English law provides that you're allowed to provide for reasonable expenses. So you pay, in a reason, £10,000 has been deemed to be, you know, it's deemed to be fair, something along those lines. Um, and then... She turns back after giving birth to the child as well. Beautiful child this is. I would like to keep the child. There is absolutely nothing. The father, the father of the sperm and the, and the mother of the egg can do. There is nothing in English all they can do. The child will belong to the mother who carried and gave birth to the child. And she will be the legal mother. The only time it can be transferred ownership is if the person making the request uh, owns the gametes, is the, is the source of the gametes, and um, the, the mother who's given birth agrees to it. So it's, it's quite, and there have been cases in English law on, on these lines, and, and fortunately always ends up very sadly that if, if, if the mother turned, to, if, the, if the legal mother turns around and wants to keep the child, there's nothing you can do. So that is the position of the English law which is very interesting. I found very interesting when I learned about it. Um, and it's all up to the gestational mother to hand over to the couple, and she is the legal mother until the law intervenes. What is the halachic position on this? So say a Jewish couple are unable to have a child, and an embryo is planted in a non-Jewish woman. Is the child Jewish because it came from a Jewish egg? Or will we say that the child is non-Jewish because the gestation and the act of parturition was through a non-Jewish woman, right? Well, what's, what's the important fact in halakha? Is it, the, is it the woman who's carried the baby? And if she is non-Jewish, then the baby will be non-Jewish. Or is it the fact they came from a Jewish egg, Jewish mother? Then it doesn't matter who carried it. The point is, is that it's within the egg. The egg is Jewish, and therefore the child will be Jewish. Or say the other way around. The sperm of the Jewish husband is fertilized with the egg of a non-Jewish woman. And then the Jewish man's wife carries the embryo. Is the child Jewish because a Jewish woman has carried the fetus? Or will we say that the child is not Jewish because the egg came from a non-Jewish mother? That's the one major ramification. There are, of course, more um, trivial, well, relatively at least, more trivial ramifications, such as kibbutz the, when the When this child grows up, who is this child's mother that the child needs to uh, do the mitzvah of kibbutz to? To the mother who uh, to the mother who carried him, 
or to the mother who's, who the egg came from, or maybe both. Um, there will be questions of um, pidyon, or there'll be questions of inheritance. Who is the halachic mother who the child inherits? There will be questions also when it comes to marriage, arayot. So you're not allowed to marry the relatives of your mother, certain relatives of your mother. Um, if you consider that the, 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 the woman who's carried you for nine months is your mother, then you won't be allowed to marry her relatives. If, however, it's the egg donor, you won't be allowed to marry her relatives. So it's not just a question of Jewish or not Jewish. There are far wider ramifications here, which need to be taken into account. So let's start with a, an agadic proof. Now we know don't normally like to bring proofs on agadic. It's a very nice proof, so we're going to start with that. But we're not going to. Well, it's not going to be the core. But let's start with this. So the famous Gemara. There's a famous Gemara regarding Dina. The Gemara in Brachot. But the Gemara tells us, you know, let's picture the scene again. We'll, we'll see the source in a moment. Let's picture the scene again. Um, Yaakov has four, two wives, two shvachot, and Leah has given birth to six six boys. Leah has given birth to two boys. Sorry, sorry. Leah has given birth to six boys. Uh, Leah's maidservant Zilpah has given birth to two boys, and Bilhah Rachel's maidservant has has given birth to two boys, ten boys in total. And the Medesh tells us that, uh, the Gemara tells us, Leah knew that Yaakov was destined to have only 12 boys, Shiftei Yahidut Israel, 12 Shavatim, who would go on to be the leaders, <coughs> excuse me, of the Jewish people. And so she became pregnant. And she becomes pregnant and she starts to think to herself, oh no, this is trouble now, because if I give birth to a boy, that means that there's going to be 11 boys born, seven to me, to, to the maidservants, and means Rachel, a maximum, will only be able to have one boy. And this isn't right that Rachel should be humiliated in that even the maidservants end up having more Shvatim, who are the, the progenitors of the Jewish people, more than Rachel herself. And in, a, in an act of reciprocation for Rachel's kindness all those years ago, when, if you remember, when uh, she swapped under the chuppah, uh, Leah does the same, and Leah prays. She prays, I don't want this to be a boy, I want this to be a girl. And the Gemara tells us this happens. Have a look at the Gemara in Brachot. The Gemara says, V'achar yalda bat v'tikra dina. The Pasuk says, after she gave birth to a girl, she called him Dina. What's V'ach? What's extra V'ach? Amarav, V'acha shadana Leah din ba'atzma v'amra. She felt hesitant. Twelve tribes, six from me and four from the maidservants, ten. If she doesn't like one of the maidservants, straight away, this fetus was transformed to a girl. And that girl became Dina. Dina, who we, yeah. So Leah ends up with six boys and one girl, and Rachel goes on to to give birth to Yosef and Binyamin. Now the Maharsha asks a fantastic question. And that's as follows. There's another Gemara Nida which says something interesting. Okay. The Gemara says, Isha mazra techila yoledet zakha. If a woman emits seed first during intercourse, then the the child will be a boy. If it's the man who emits the seeds first, then it's a female. What's the source for this? The source is the Pasuk in Bereshit. Look at this verse carefully. What does it say here? The sons of Leah, which she gave birth to Yaakov. So the sons are related to the Leah. But then look when it comes to the girl, et Dina Bito and Dina, his daughter. It says the Gemara, the facts that the Pasuk attributes 
the birth of the boys, Bnei to Leah, and the birth of the girl to Dina. This shows you that when it's the woman who emits the seed first, then she will have boys. When it's the man, his daughter, when it's the man who emits seed first, then he'll give birth to a daughter, Dina. Wonderful. Okay? Does that make sense? So says the Gemara Nida that if you want to know how to have boys or girls, you need to know who needs to emit the seed first. If it's the, and if it's the man who emits seed first, then it'll be a girl. If it's the uh, woman who emits seed first, then it'll be a boy. What's the source? The source is that when it talks about the children of Leah, it talks about the boys attributable to Leah and the girls attributable to the father, Yaakov. What's the obvious question here? What's the glaring question? Which the Marsha picks up on. Let's think for a moment. Let's go back. Again, what are we being told? We're being told that because it's attribute, the verse attributes the birth of Dina. The verse attributes the birth, the birth of Dina to, um, to her father. That shows that when the man emits the seeds first, it's a girl. And then it attributes the girl, the boys, to Leah because Leah emitted the seeds first. So, yes, David, what's the question? One second, I can't hear you. One second, one second. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go. I can't hear. Yeah? You have to speak into the screen. I can't hear you. Okay, we can't hear. No, we can't hear anything. I can't hear anything at least. I'm sorry, we can't hear. I have to. Yeah. Um, so the, the question is asks the Marsha, is that. Sorry, I'm just going to mute you. The question is, ask the Marsha, think about it, is that Dina was meant to be a boy. Remember, let's leave aside, you know, how all of this works, okay? Let's, let's just accept what Chazal have told us for the moment. Now, this morning's not to go into this. But Dina, officially, was meant to be a boy. Well, it was a boy until they are prayed. Now, you're bringing me a source from the fact it attributes the birth of Dina to the father, then that means the father emitted the seed first. And therefore, whenever a man emits the seed first, the girl is born. But the problem is, is that Dina wasn't a girl. Dina was a boy. Dina entered the world as a boy until they are prayed. So how can you bring me a proof to say that when the, when the man emits the seeds first, the girl is born? If it's the, if it's the, um, um, is everyone with me, yeah? Does everyone understand the, que does everyone understand the question of the Marsha, right? You're bringing me a proof from the fact that Dina's birth is attributable to the father. Um, that shows that when the father emits the seed first, then it's a girl. But the problem is that Dina was first born as a boy, not born. The father was first conceived as a boy. So surely this is a, a, a clear contradiction between the two. Marsha comes up with something fascinating. And again, don't ask me on how these things work. We're just working what, with what we're told. Um, and he says, actually, fascinatingly, is that it's not that the fetus itself changed from girl to boy. Excuse me, not the fetus itself changed from boy to girl, but rather that the fetuses in Rachel and Leah's wombs swapped. That's different to how, how we've always understood it. I've always understood it until I came across this Marsha was that when Leah prayed, then Leah's own fetus changed from a boy to a girl. The Marashah explains that no, Dina was always a girl. 
But originally, she was in the room of Rachel. Yosef was always a boy, but Yosef was in the room of Leah. When they are prayed, the fetuses were switched. That's what the Marasha answers. So according to this, we have a situation similar, similarly to surrogacy and egg donation, where the egg is from one woman while another woman gives birth, right? The egg is from Leah, and it's Rachel who gives birth. And who do we call the mother of Yosef? We call the mother of Yosef to be Rachel. Even though, according to the Maharsha, Yosef originated in the womb of, it was the egg of Leah. This is absolutely fascinating. According to the Maharsha, Yosef, Yosef's egg came from Leah. And that then swapped over to um, Rachel's womb. Yes, let's see the Maharsha inside. It says the Maharsha in Brachot. Well, oh, I didn't bring it here. Okay, it's a shame. Okay, fine. So it's the Maharsha in Brachot. In any case, um, you see clearly from there, according to the common understanding that Rachel is the mother of Yosef, Leah is the mother of Dina. Right, that's how we always been brought up, right? Rachel. You see clearly it's the birth mother who is the halachic mother. Because even though the egg came from Leah, still Rachel is considered as being the mother of Yosef, and vice versa, Leah is the mother of Dina. So this is a, a proof, some would argue, that you follow the, the mother, the, the, the woman who's, who, who carries for the nine months. Um, now, this isn't a great proof, as I said, because we generally don't like to bring proofs from Agada. These are very weak proofs when you have to go, revert to Agada, to all these kinds of Midrashim and homiletical uh, 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 passages in the Talmud. And the Midrash, we don't really like to rely on these types of things. So let's think about, let's step back, let's just think back at the logic for a moment, okay? Logically, what would we say? So some argue that the egg is a decisive factor because the egg contains all the genetic information. The surrogate just develops existing potential. Furthermore, it's clear that regarding a man, it's the sperm of the man which is the decisive factor, right? It's not the physical act of intercourse. So there is the there's the famous legend, well, legend, whatever. There's a famous story about Ben Sira. Ben Sira being born from the seed of Yirmiya in the bathhouse. Okay, this is it's a it's a we won't go into this now, but there are, this is actually brought down in halachic works um, of Ben Sira being born from the seed of Yirmiya, which Yirmiya had left in the bathhouse. Okay, don't ask me how and what happened there, but apparently Yirmiya's seed was left in the bathhouse and the woman came in and um, she fell pregnant from that. And that was the father of, of Ben Sira. And everyone agrees that this, the ben, according to this, uh, according to this understanding, Ben Sira is the child of Yirmiya. So you see clearly it's not the act; it's the act, it's not the act of intercourse which creates the halachic father. It's the actual sperm. And so therefore, you could argue logically that the same applies when it comes to the woman. It's the egg, not the act of the carry. However, this is for me is a very weak argument because you can't compare the act of um, fertilization of a man to the woman carrying for nine months, right? There's a big difference between the man, the man's sperm for a few moments and a woman for nine months, right? Uh, the woman accompanies the child for nine months. Uh, therefore, you can't just say it's the egg which determines parentage. Right? There's a big difference between uh, carrying a child and being with it for nine months. Uh, you know, maybe that, that would be the decisive factor. Others argue that the carry is the determinative factor because once the egg has been detached from its source, it's lost its connection to the original person, it's now an individual entity. So what are the Talmudic sources on this? Are there Talmudic proofs on this? This is a question, as you can imagine, which has only come to light in the last 50 to 60 years. So obviously the poskim of today have to grapple with very old sources and try to find some kind of, um, some kind of source within the Gemara. Okay, is everyone still with me? Any questions until now? So, so far we've, uh, 
introduced the, the English law. We've seen the importance of assisting. Um, we've seen the importance of assisting a couple to give birth. We've seen that there are arguments on either side, and there seems to be a proof from the story of uh, from the Marsha, at least from the story of Dina, that you follow the the mother who carries the child and not the actual egg. But are there any sources in the Gemara itself? So there are sources in the Gemara. So a woman, a non-Jewish woman, who wants to convert, and she happens to be pregnant at the same time. Does that child, when the child is born, need conversion? So the Gemara Yavamot says very clearly that if a woman enters the mikvah, pregnant, and she converts to Judaism, then that child born let's say she, she goes to the mikveh and she becomes Jewish five months pregnant. Four months later, she, give birth, she gives birth to a child. That child does not need conversion. That child is considered Jewish. Why? The Gemara, there's two reasons given, but the main reason given is ubar yerich imo, which means the fetus is considered an extension of the mother. That's one reason. Another reason given is that actually we, we look at it as if the fetus itself has dipped into the water and we don't consider the mother's stomach as being a chatzitza, as being an interposition, because this is a natural place for the fetus to be. It's nothing unnatural about the mother's womb. In any case, there are two reasons given. But whichever reason you go with, the very fact that the Gemara itself says that it has to give a reason why it is that the child doesn't need a conversion once it's born, indicates to you that you don't just follow the birth. If you were to say that you follow the birth mother, then the mother converted during pregnancy, and when she gives birth, she's a Jew. If you follow the act of birth, and that's the important factor, then surely the child should be Jewish because it's born from a Jewish mother. The very fact that the Gemara has to give a source and reasons why it is that the child born does not need to go to mikvah, has to give two different reasons, shows you that you follow the egg. And really, in principle, the child does need a conversion, right? That's one source to show that you follow the egg mother and not the birth mother. Because if you followed the birth mother, there would be no question in the Gemara. It would be very straightforward that you have to give uh, the, the child has to be Jewish because it was born from a Jewish mother. The very fact that the has to give reasons shows you that it's not so simple that you do follow the egg mother. But then there's another source the other way around. And again, it comes from the subya of conversion. So if you have twin brothers in the mother's room, conceived whilst the mother, listen carefully to this case. So you have twin brothers conceived by a non-Jewish woman. The mother wasn't Jewish when she was conceived. Then she converts three months into pregnancy. She gives birth to two twin boys as a Jew. Halakha is very clear in the Gemara and in the Shulchan Aruch that these two boys aren't allowed to marry the wives of the brother. So let's say you have, let's take a different scenario. Let's say you have a mother, a non-Jewish mother who gives birth to two non-Jewish boys' twins. Totally non-Jewish. 20 years later, these two boys decide to convert at 20 years old. These two boys go on to marry two women, Sarah and Rachel. Ruven marries Sarah and Shimon marries Rachel. They then get divorced. Both couples get divorced. Halakha is very clear that they are allowed to marry their brother's wife. Because Halakha doesn't view these two boys as having any connection between themselves. These are two, even though they were conceived and given and, and their mother gave birth to them as twins, 
nonetheless, because they converted, they're new entities now. And therefore, we don't view it as marrying your brother. You're not allowed to marry your brother's wife. But we don't view this as you're marrying your brother's wife because the halakha views these two boys as being two separate human beings. Okay? Good. But halakha is when it comes to the twin boys who are conceived from their mother as non-Jews, but their mother converted while she was pregnant with these twin boys, they're not allowed to marry each other's spouse. Right? So you have a non-Jewish mother, falls pregnant with twin boys, converts at three months, gives birth to two Jewish boys. Those Jewish boys go on, marry two women. They get divorced from those two women. Those boys can't marry the wife of their brother. Now, if the egg is the determinative factor, then surely they should have no connection anymore. Because if you follow the egg, then the egg, there were two non-Jews. Then you should view this as exactly the same scenario as what we've talked about, where you have um, uh, uh, two, two boys converting in their, when, as adults, and then they can marry each other if you follow the egg, because they were two non-Jews as eggs. But if the birth is the determinative factor, then we can understand the Salakha. So as you can see, there are sources both ways. There are more sources. I'm not going to get into now. I'm just conscious of the time. There are more sources both ways. Um, but, and as I said, the Halakha authorities in the last 40 years or so have all tried bringing proofs either way. What's the final Halakha? Let's get down to Tachis because we're running out of time. What's the final Halakha with all of this? So Chaum Vadia Yosef held very strongly that you follow the egg. The egg is the genetic mother. Um, she holds all the information. That's who you follow. And therefore, as long as the egg comes from a Jewish mother, even if it's carried by a non-Jew, child is Jewish. This was also the position of his student, the former chief rabbi of Israel, Rav Shomo Amar. However, Mamode Chayliyao, Another chief rabbi of Israel, who I learned in Israel, in his kolel, um, he held no. He held it's the mother who gives birth, who is the legal and halachic mother. So you see, even in the last 20, 30 years, how, you know, the two heavyweights of the Sephardi were, Chaum Badiah Yosef, held it's the egg mother, and Chaum de Chayliyao held it's the, it's the act of patrician, the mother who's, who gives birth will be the mother. Um, in practice, what happens? Since there is no clear approach, the main halakha is to follow that it's the egg, which is the determinative factor, but, but we will do a giyur, le a conversion as a stringency. To say the, to say the egg comes from a Jewish mother, and it's carried by a non-Jewish woman for nine months. So then we would say that strictly speaking, we could maybe argue that the child is Jewish, but as a stringency, we will dip the child in the mikveh just to ensure that the child is Jewish. The other way around would be more difficult. The other way around, where the egg came from a non-Jew and it was carried by a Jewish mother for nine months, then general consensus is to view it more as a non more as a non-Jew. But of course, we would have to do a giyur. In both scenarios, we wouldn't make a blessing on the conversion, out of doubt. But this is the important factor. And if we've had this scenario, actually, in the Bedin, is that when it's the mother who is, it's when the egg is mother is Jewish and the carrier is non-Jewish, then it will be easier to be lenient with the conversion than vice versa. So say you have a parent, and unfortunately we've had this case, where the mother isn't actually fully observant. Now, of course, we would never consider a conversion if the, the, if the parent, you know, a conversion for a child, we'd never consider it if the parents aren't religious, haven't made 
efforts over the conversion process. But if you say that really me, Kar din strictly speaking, we view this child as being Jewish and we're just doing a Giyul Khumra, then it'll be easier to be lenient and to, and to look over the fact that the mother isn't fully religious. However, the other way around would be much more difficult. If you were to have the mother, who the, the Jewish mothers carried the child, but it came from a non-Jewish egg for whatever reason, then we would demand a proper conversion because that's a uh, because then it's more likely that we view this as being a non-Jewish child. So you see, so so as I said, you know, there's no clear approach. Um, it's more in favor for it being a non-Jewish uh, for for following the, the the where the egg comes from, whether Jewish or not. And I'll end one one final point. You would assume for everything which I've said. Now, in the first instance, you should try to find a Jewish carrier. This would alleviate, if you were to have a Jewish egg and a Jewish carrier, this would alleviate all the problems. However, some argue that it's better to take a non-Jewish carrier, and I'll tell you why, fascinatingly. Why would it be better to take a non-Jewish carrier? This is so there won't be a problem of the child born marrying a half-sister. If the carrier is Jewish, and we consider her to be the mother of the boy born, and the boy born cannot marry the daughters of the woman who carried him. And this may not be information he will know in 20, 30 years time when he looks to get married. He knows the mother who's brought him up. He doesn't know the woman who carried him for nine months. He may never be even be told about it. And he goes out in the world and he marries a girl. And that girl may be the daughter of the woman who carried him. And if we say that the mother woman who carried him is the legal mother, halachic mother, he's, he's marrying his sister. With the ramifications of mamzerim and forbidden relationships and all of that. If you use a non-Jewish woman, then that's not going to happen. Even if she converts, fine. That's going to be absolutely fine. So that's why some advise it's better to take a, a non-Jew. Um, I'll end with this, and that is Baruch Hashem in Israel, over the last 10 years, there have been huge developments with this. And now, because there is now a new national registry of any surrogacy in Israel, um, and everything is documented, therefore, now in Israel, Jewish women are used, if possible. And then, and there'll be no chance of there being a problem later on in 20, 30 years time because everything is now being documented and therefore that the, the, you know, an egg donor is assured the child will be given. Also, the law now is in Israel that you have to give it to the same religion. If you uh, donate an egg as a Jew, then it has to be given to a Jew. If you donate a, an egg as a Muslim, it has to be given to, to, to a Muslim, right? So this has alleviated all the concerns in Israel in other countries, we still have this issue. This is a real, this is a, this is a real issue. Um, and as you can see, there is no final clear answer. And it's, uh, it's something which, you know, but you grapple with and have to do the best in, in, you know, with all the facts and all the opinions which we have and do our best to, to, to come to a conclusion. So in conclusion, who is the child of a um, Jewish egg uh, by a non-Jewish carrier? In conclusion, it is a machloket, um, and it seems more in line with the opinions that it's a uh, you follow the the egg. But in either case, we'll have to do a giur lechumah. Okay, are there any questions on that? Is there any difference between the Ashkenazi and Tafadi approach? No, no, it's the same. Rabbi Yashiv held the same. Rabbi Yashiv held as well. That make a din, you follow the the, the egg. Um, I know London based and do the same. They also take on that the main mother is the they do giur lechumra um, when it's the mother who is uh, the carry the carry who's not Jewish and the uh, and the egg mother being Jewish. They'll do the same. It's it's basic. This isn't again. You know, I don't like I don't like Ashkenazi Sephardi divides and things which only come up in the last forty years. It's not possible. That's not, 
Just because Rav Adi Yosef said something doesn't mean it's a Fadi. Just because Rav Adi Yosef said something doesn't mean it's Ashkenazi. That's a big mistake people make, right? If you're talking about Ravadi's opinions about things from the Gemara's times, fine, that's a Sephardi approach to things, and that's the way Shohan Aruch takes, etc., etc., fine. But a modern-day question like this, such as surrogacy, such as all these kinds of modern-day questions, just because Rav Shem Zaron Orbach has said something about modern-day questions, doesn't mean it's Ashkenazi, and it's limited to Ashkenazim, and vice versa for Sephardim as well. Ravadi herself held about certain things, which are modern-day questions, that it's a Sephardi approach. Okay, good. Unless there are any further questions, we'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, Diane Kada, for joining us and giving us the benefit of your knowledge on this uh, topic. And we look forward to welcoming you back again in the not too distant future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kenneth. Always a pleasure to be here. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Very informative. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.